Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so glad we planned this for today. <laughs> My name is Bishar Dumani. I'm a professor in the Department of History. I'm also director of Middle East Studies here at Brown University. And welcome to our teach-in, Trump's ban, and enough said. Um, we have a terrific panel of uh, speakers here today, and my role will simply be just to say a few introductory words framing the issue and introducing the panelists. They will speak for no more than 10 minutes each, and so we'll reserve most of the time of our meeting today for question and answer period. There are two microphones on either side. You can just line up as, as soon as we finish. Um, as you know, uh, on January 27th, Friday, uh, Trump signed uh, three executive orders, one of which is the one we're most concerned with today on immigration and refugees, blocking refugees from Syria, entering the United States indefinitely, barring people hailing from seven uh, Middle East countries, Iraq, Syria, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen, um, temporarily suspending the issuance of visas in these countries, uh, canceling 60,000 to 100,000 already existing visas and so on and so forth. Um, there was an international outcry. There was a, a lot of uh, uh, resistance on the streets, not just in the United States, but globally. It's very heartwarming uh, to see uh, the special moment that we're in today in which uh, Opposition uh, to this regime is crossing class lines, is crossing religious lines, is crossing ethnic lines, uh, is crossing uh, national lines. And uh, this is certainly a moment which is pregnant with possibilities for organizing for the future. Um, it's also been uh, opposed from within the branches of the US government itself. As you all know, a judge in Seattle, uh, uh, temporarily suspended the ban, um, and uh, oral arguments and other arguments are being made in the judicial branch today. We don't know what will happen. What we do know is much of the discuss discussion has been around whether it's an anti-Muslim ban or not, that is to say whether it discriminates on the basis of religion. And uh, for many of us who have been watching the Middle East for a long time and watching US policy towards the Middle East, the answer, uh, of course, is yes. Um, it's very obvious, uh, obvious from the statements of the president himself and during the campaign, obvious from the personnel, the people who wrote the actual order, what their record is and how they've been lobbying for over a decade uh, on an Islamophobic kind of platform, um, et cetera. But also for us who work on Middle East studies, we are sensitive to code words about the region and I was amazed that these code words were actually in the executive order itself. I'll just read you a very quick couple of sentences. To ensure, quote, that those admitted to this country do not bear hostile attitudes towards it and its founding principles. And this has been the basic sentence that's been used behind the slogan, uh, Islam hates us, which is actually what he tweeted at one point in 2015. And, um, uh, and said in interviews, um, the United States, quote, cannot and should not admit those who do not support the Constitution or those who would place violent ideologies over American law. And this is in direct reference to a huge campaign uh, uh, by right-wing movements in this country for the last 10, 15 years, arguing that there is a, a secret plot to impose Sharia law in the United States. And in fact, that issue reached uh, debate in many states and uh, uh, government bodies. Then it says, in addition, the United States should not admit those who engage in acts of bigotry or hatred, parentheses, including quote unquote honor killings, other forms of violence against women, or the persecution of those who practice religions different from their own. And this is also in direct reference to a public discourse on the Middle East among those groups. If you just look at their websites, and if you look at their spokespeople, these are exactly the words that they've been using all along. So what you have is a fringe, Islamophobic fringe in US political culture that is in charge of these policies now. 
This is a fluid situation, like I mentioned before, the public outcry in the United States across the globe, the legal challenges from the judicial branch, and even institutional uh, resistance from within parts of the U.S. government or former members of that establishment, such as the former secretaries of states or heads of the CIA and national security uh, apparatuses that have actually put their names on a petition to the court saying this will hurt the country and it's, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all this combined with this uh, ideological fervor of this organ, uh, administration, the lack of experience that they've had, makes for a very fluid and unpredictable situation. It's also going to be a long-term situation. We would be fooling ourselves if we thought we're in the middle of a state of emergency and that somehow things will get back on track. This is not going to happen. And it will not happen for years. And in fact, what we will feel, I believe, will be a greater and greater escalation. In fact, our heartbeats are just going to be beating faster and faster. It will be very important to look around us, uh, take advantage of the strategic opportunities we have to make alliances across uh, the entire spectrum I mentioned earlier, and to pace ourselves and think strategically in how to oppose this assault, really, on uh, not only our, the core values that this country professes, uh, uh, but also on numerous other fundamental fronts, assault on the environment, and most of all perhaps an assault on the African American community and other minorities that have been steeped in racist discourse in this country for generations and, 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 and more, an assault not just on Muslims uh, but also on women, and, um, and on the, uh, the list can go on. Um, one issue that you need to pay attention to is whether the United States uh, government under Trump will sign legislation saying that the Muslim Brotherhood is a, for, is a terrorist organization. This is being considered for next week. Um, the same people who wrote this executive order have been arguing for years that the civil society institutions of the Muslim communities of US citizens in the United States like CARE and others, are actually fronts for the Muslim Brotherhood. That has been their claim all along. So this would be specifically, really, uh, not having anything to do with the Muslim Brother in Egypt or elsewhere as much as it has to do with criminalizing an entire part of the population. Uh, and that represents a major challenge uh, coming up across the horizon for next week. So. We want to say that we are not standing alone, that this is a global issue. Trump is not the only one of his kind. In fact, I can think of Harper's government in Canada that has done many of the same things, uh, right-wing movements in Europe and elsewhere, uh, that this is um, uh, an issue that we should never forget affects real people with real names and real families. Um, and so we've organized a teach-in to really press these three things, the personal, human angle, the global angle, and we will end with a uh, brief presentation on the question of whether international law will be of any use to us in thinking about how to deal uh, with this global challenge. Coming first, and I will introduce them all very quickly uh, in the order that which they will appear, and then we'll line up here for the question and answer period is uh, Srimati Mitter, uh, the Kutaib al Ghanim Assistant Professor of Middle East History and International Public Affairs at Brown University. She is completing her first book entitled The History of Money in Palestine from the 1900s to the present. Her work examines the economic and monetary dimensions of state statelessness. Her broader academic interests include economic, social, and political history of the modern Middle East, and she'll be speaking about who are the Syrian refugees. Nargis Bajoli will go second. She's a postdoctoral research associate at the Watson Institute at Brown University, a sociocultural anthropologist, and her research focuses on pro-regime media in Iran. But actually, you most know her and love her as a public intellectual who has spoken widely and written widely for the major journals and uh, newspapers and magazines in this country, as well as radio and others. I will not list them all. She'll speak about organizing 
efforts in Middle Eastern American communities around the anti-Muslim ban and the potential challenges the community faces in the coming months. Then Brigo Singh, will, uh, who's assistant professor of anthropology at Brown and a faculty fellow at the Watson Institute, uh, will be next. He has published widely on issues of religion, politics, media, and popular culture. Uh, his recent book, please, there's lots of seats, just to help people uh, find a place to sit, that'd be great. His most recent, his recent book titled Poverty and the Quest for Life, Spiritual and Material Striving in Contemporary Rural India, um, was awarded the Joseph W. Elder Prize in Indian Social Sciences. He is the co-editor of The Ground Between Anthropological Engagements with Philosophy and serves as associate editor of the Journal of Ethnographic Theory. He'll be speaking, I love this title, Hindus for Trump. Um, uh, and we're telling, you know, we've been trying to understand what does Modi's experience in India teach us and how are they similar or different from the Trump administration. Matthew Gutman, um, Professor of Anthropology, he's in also the Population Studies and Training Center faculty, he's also Director of BRE, the Brown International Advanced Research Institute and a faculty fellow at the Watson Institute and many other administrative positions from before. Um, most of his ethnographic research has been on Mexico, especially the question of masculinity, gender, health, um, and many other things. I will just say that his title is Impartial is Not an Option, The White Lash, The Wall, and The Brown Peril. I kind of switched it for you. Um, and then finally, Arnold uh, uh, Becker Lorca, uh, who's a visiting faculty at the International Relations Program at Brown University, will um, complete this panel. He received his uh, SJD from Harvard Law School and his book, Mestizo International Law, a Global Intellectual History, 1842 to 1933, uh, was the winner of the 2016 Book Prize for European Society of International Law. And his title is A Double-Edged Sword, The Human and in International Law. So thank you very much for agreeing to do this, and we can start uh, with Srimati. And thank you so much for coming. For most of us, the story of this executive order began on the 27th of January. Um, in fact, just uh, a week ago. But for the people I'm going to talk about today, the story begins much, much earlier. I'm going to start with the story of my friend Haider. Haider is 20 years old, and the first thing you notice about him is that he's very, very thin. He looks like he hasn't eaten in years, and he eats like a horse, and he still remains thin. Haider comes from the village of Irfin in northern Syria, very, very close to the Turkish border. In November 2014, Haider lost his entire family to the fighting in Syria. And he walked um, in the middle of the night, he walked on foot on his own, he crossed the border into Turkey, and he spent a few months living clandestinely in Turkey. And then he got onto an inflatable boat. These are the boats um, that many of you have seen pictures of. He paid all the money he had and money he didn't have, he borrowed money from people he knew, to a trafficker, and he got on an inflatable boat and he crossed from Turkey into Greece on water. He lived in Greece clandestinely for a year, no papers, nothing, no family. And then somehow he made it to France. I don't know how he made it, he never talks about it. I know he had a false passport. I met him when I moved to France several years ago, three years ago, uh, because he helped me move. And I remember thinking when he was carrying my many boxes of books, how thin he was and how, how frail he seemed. And um, I always asked him, how did he get to France? And he would never, ever tell me the story. I think partly because he lives with this fear every single day of, of being thrown out. 
Then I want to talk about the Kasso family. The Kasso family is a Kurdish family which comes from the region near Aleppo, near Halab in Syria. This is a family of three women and one little baby girl who's two months old. Three women and a baby girl. They fled from their village near Aleppo to Iraqi Kurdistan, to the Kurdish area of Iraq, because they're Kurdish. In the course of that flight from Syria to Iraq, they lost all the men in their family. The father, the uncle, the husband. The only ones who survived are these three women who I met. They made it to France in April 2015. Pa uh, partly, what, partly the reason why I know them is because I helped work on their application process. And when they arrived in, um, in France, when I got to meet them, they were completely traumatized and they too wouldn't talk very much about their journey from Syria to France. All they would talk about was, what can we do to get papers now that we're in France? And every time I asked the, the, the person who became the matriarch of the family, this, the oldest woman who was sort of trying to look after all the other women, every time I asked her what I could do to help her, she said, I used to be a lawyer in Syria. I don't need help. I just want papers so that I can work. Then there's the Bakr family. This is the family I got to know, I would say, the best during my time living in France. Bakr left very, very late from Syria because he's one of those people who really didn't want to leave, who's very, very attached to his home. They left in May or June of 2015, the day that Bakr realized that the Syrian government was going to draft him into the Syrian army. And he said, I just couldn't stay. I couldn't stay and fight against my compatriots. I wanted to stay. I wanted to remain neutral. I'm not with the government. I'm not against the government. Like so many people in Syria, he's caught up in this thing that's so much bigger than him. And for a, for a lot of us, you know, the word neutrality means so many things. And for me, it means just staying out of a fight. For Bakr and for his family, remaining neutral meant that he would be killed. So they decided to leave, as I said, very late in the story, in May 2015. Bakr and his wife have two children. They're, they were seven and five at the time. And Bakr's mother was about 70 years old. They all walked on foot for eight days from their village in Syria, again in northern Syria. This is another Kurdish family. They walked from northern Syria to Istanbul. They are actually very, very lucky because their brother lives in France, and that's how I got to know them. That's how I got to know many of these families, because their brother has been living in France for a few years and has been tirelessly trying to get as many people as he can to get to France. So Bakr and his two children and his mother and his wife walked for eight days, made it to Istanbul, and in, within about a year, they made it to France. And. Uh, the, I got to know the children very well, the five-year-old boy and the seven-year-old boy. And uh, I remember I was sitting with them and watching football, um, soccer, as, you would, as Americans would call it. It was the European Cup last year, I think some of you remember it. And we were sitting and watching a football match. And uh, the French government had helicopters flying um, to make sure that there was, a, that there was safety. In. And the moment there was this noise of this helicopter, both the little boys immediately said to me, Srimati, let's, we have to run to the bathroom. Let's go and hide in the bathroom. And I said, why are we going to hide in the bathroom? Let's watch the football match. And uh, they said, but there's a helicopter. That, that was their immediate association with the noise of a helicopter. That's all they've ever known all their lives, is that when there's a helicopter, when there's that kind of noise, they have to go and hide in, in a bathroom. I want to end with the story of Yusuf, and I want to spend a bit of time with the story of Yusuf. Yusuf Hanna, he is uh, an Iraqi student who I met when I was a graduate student at Harvard. He was um, a student in, a, in an intro history class I was teaching at Harvard. And I noticed him very early on because like some of you, or unlike many of you, he always sat in the first row, always, every single class. And he always took notes 
And yet, whenever I asked a question of the class, he never ever answered. I could tell he wanted to speak. I could tell he had this desperate sort of look in his eyes and he always wanted to speak, but he never ever spoke in class. So one day I asked him to come and see me during, you know, outside of class. And he came and talked to me and uh, I said, you know, I didn't know anything about him. I said, how are you doing? As I do to many of you, I see many of my students here. So I sort of said, how are you doing? Are you liking the class? And slowly his story came out. Yusuf Hanna um, is an Iraqi boy. He comes from the town of Mosul. He's a Christian. In 2003, when the US Army invaded Iraq, his father, who has a BA degree in French and who worked as a school teacher, decided that he would make money by working as an interpreter for the US Army because he spoke English. His father started working for the US Army very, very early on, in 2003. In 2005, Yusuf has an older sister. She's five years older than him. She was kidnapped. They don't know by whom, uh, but it is clear that she was kidnapped because Yusuf's father was working with the US Army. So Yusuf's father stopped working for the US Army and they fled overnight to northern Iraq, to the Kurdish side of Iraq. And um, desperately kept looking for their daughter. From 2005 to 2007, they, they got no news of their daughter. And finally, Yusuf's father decided that his, his remaining family members, including Yusuf, were in danger of being killed. Because even though he'd stopped working for the US Army, that cloud always stood above their head that, oh, this family has worked for the US Army. So Yusuf's father went to the US Army in, in the Kurdish town that they were living, the, where they were hiding, and said to the US Army, please, can you help us get out? You know, I, I fear that my daughter has been kidnapped. Perhaps she's been killed. I have a very young son. I have a wife. Can you help us? And the US Army officers that he spoke to, they said, sorry, we can't. We feel really bad for you, but everyone who's working for us is being killed. So this is one of the myths, really, that the US Army has at least helped the interpreters and the translators who worked for, for the army. It's not true. They wanted to, but they couldn't. Yusuf's father finally managed to get through to the International Organization of Migration, which was organizing a lot of the trying to get visas for Iraqis to come to America. And the process took so long. They started in 2007 when they first registered with the International Organization of Migration. They didn't get their papers till 2009. And the day they got their papers, when they were leaving, Yusuf's mother said to Yusuf and his father, I'm not leaving. What about my daughter? Maybe she's still here. And Yusuf, who was at that point 14 years old, he had to sit down with his mother. His father had to sit down with her and convince her, let it go. She's gone. She's not coming back. Let's move to America. Let's at least try to save our lives. So in 2009, Yusuf and his family managed to move to America. And um, his father worked in a storage facility lifting boxes. Uh, his mother worked in the kitchen cooking meals in the same high school where Yusuf went to school. And Yusuf made it. He made it to Harvard. He sat in the first row of my class. His father very much wanted him to go to medical school. And uh, when Yusuf told his father he was taking my class, his father went ballistic. He said, no, why are you taking a Middle Eastern history class? We've left that behind. Study for medical school, take pre-med classes, do not take Middle Eastern history. What is that? We're not from there. Yusuf stayed in my class, and I think he's probably maybe taken Elias's class, I don't know. He took a lot of Arabic literature at Harvard. He stuck with it. I spoke to him yesterday. He got into medical school, and he's going to medical school um, next year. What links these stories? What each of these stories have in common, apart from the fact that um, I know them all, and I'm lucky enough to know them all, what links these stories is that they, each one of them are the lucky ones. Each one of them are the tiny, tiny, tiny minority of people who managed to get out. I spoke to each of them yesterday and day before when I was trying to think about what I would want to share with you. And I asked each of them, what should I say to my students? What should I say about this ban? And I just want to leave you with their words because I think it's important that we hear what they have to say. 
So Heather, the 20 year old who's living still clandestinely in France, I don't think, I don't think he's ever going to get papers because of the way he got to France. What he said to me was, um, well, are any of your students girls and will any of them marry me? Because maybe that's how I can get to America. Um, and then he said, oh, and you're still not married, so do you want to marry me? And that's not the first time he's asked. So I said, hi there, you're 20 years old. <laughs> okay, so that was Heather's message for me. Um, the Casso family, the family, the three women who lost all their men, I asked the, the oldest lady, what should I say to all of you? And she repeated the same thing she's been telling me every time I talk to her. She said, Kunt Mohami, I was a lawyer. I don't need your help. I just need papers. Please give me papers. I want to work. I want to look after my family and I want to work. I asked Bakr's son, uh, uh, Rashid is his name, he's five years old. What, what should I tell Americans about him, about his story? And he said, please, can you tell them, I don't want to be on a plane ever again. I don't want to be on a plane. I'm scared of planes. I want to stay in France. And now, by the way, Rashid refuses to speak to me in Arabic. When I call him, he'll only speak in French. When I'll say uh, marhaba, which is the way you say hello in Arabic, he'll always say bonjour. He's very proud that he's learned French very, very quickly. But this is what he said to tell all of you that he doesn't want to be on a plane again, and that he's scared of planes. But the really, I think, the most powerful and the most moving thing I heard was from Halusi, who's the, the person I knew through whom I met all of these families when I was living in France, and Yusuf, the student, the Iraqi student at Harvard. And what both of them said to me was, you know, strangely enough, the same thing. They said, put yourselves in my shoes. What would you do if you were me? What would you do if this was your story? Where would you go? And I'll leave you with that. Thank you. It's a very hard presentation to follow. Thank you, Shamati. Um, so I'm going to be speaking a little bit about um, the Muslim, tra well, Trump's travel ban um, and how it's actually not that new um, and how there's a historical precedence, not only if we dig back deep enough, uh, the way in which immigration laws in this country for a while did not allow, for example, Chinese to come into uh, the United States and things like that, but I'm gonna focus a little bit more on contemporary history, so things that happened post-2001, uh, uh, post-9-11. Um, just to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, because I'm going to be uh, going quickly through it so that we have time for everyone's presentations, I'll talk about the post-9-11 and Sears program, which is sort of the, the backbone of what the Trump travel ban ended up being. Um, a quick overview of what happened and where things are as of today, because they keep moving and changing very quickly. Um, how Middle Eastern American and Muslim American communities are responding. And finally, what rights do people have and what resources are available? Um, so just to start out, the, um, uh, after 9-11, uh, there was a program put into place by President Bush called NSEERS, National Security Entry Exit Registration System. Uh, it was um, put into place direct, exactly a year after 9-11 happened. Uh, at the time, because of the atmosphere of 9-11 and the national security that sort of we were all involved in as a country, this um, program did not get as much coverage outside of the communities that were uh, targeted by it. So um, all male 16 years of age and over had to be registered. Um, and non-visa holders, meaning students, uh, workers, tourists, were made to register in three different ways. One is anyone entering the country who is not a US citizen from any of the 25 countries, which I'll talk about in a second, were uh, made to fingerprint, uh, their photos were taken, and they were all interrogated in a special interrogation room uh, at, the at, the, at their port of entry. Um, two, um, 
They also had to regularly check in with immigration officials when they were in the United States and had to do exit uh, interviews when they left um, the countries in which they were here from. And third, they were kept, um, everyone was kept track of as they were leaving. So they had to do exit interviews. And anyone who violated these, um, and it was very easy to violate because at the time, remember, we didn't have social media quite yet. And it was uh, very difficult to get a lot of the information about this uh, and Sears program out to different communities that were affected. So those who violated it, which were a lot of students who came in at that time, did not know that this had to that they had to undergo this process, were either arrested, fined, or deported, and never allowed back into the U.S. again. Um, the 25 countries were all Muslim majority, but one. The only exception was North Korea. Uh, the list of the other countries are up there. Um, and it is important to note that uh, civil rights groups and uh, community organizations did fight back for about a decade against the NCRS program. And finally, under a lot of pressure, President Obama um, abolished this program just days before he left office because of the talk that President elect Trump at that time had about instituting a Muslim, a Muslim registry. And so a lot of community organizations were saying, hey, there already is a, um, a infrastructure in place for a Muslim registry to take place because we actually kind of had one. And in order to not give that as a gift to uh, President elect Trump, uh, abolish it. And he ended up abolishing it just days before he left office. Um, but where did the seven countries come from that are in the Trump ban? Um, part of that is uh, you have to go back and look at what the Obama administration did. There was a law, there was a bill that uh, President Obama passed into law in December of 2015 that was sort of um, cased into a much larger uh, series of uh, bills about bu the budget. So it was, it was kind of difficult for him to, he had to sign the entire bill into law, but what that part of that bill included was a um, revoking the visa waiver privileges of um, anyone who came from the seven countries that are now on the banned list. So what that means is that anyone who had traveled to any of the seven countries that are listed, meaning journalists, humanitarian workers, um, physicians, if they were then going to come into the US, they had to get a visa. So if they were French, physicians, for example, who had volunteered or worked in Iraq, they then had to, instead of being able to come into the United States without having a, a, a visa, which uh, French people can do, they had to get a visa to be able to do that. And then importantly, it also affected dual nationals from any of these seven countries who had nationalities in the European Union. Um, so if you are French Iranian or Syrian, uh, German Syrian, and, and even if you've never been to the country of origin, um, but just by the fact of having nationality or the potential of having nationality, you were then not allowed to just enter the United States without a visa like your other compatriots, but you had to request a, a visa to come into the US. So this is where the, these seven countries come from. Uh, and even though community organizations, Muslim American and Middle Eastern American community organizations fought back very heavily against this visa waiver program in December of 2015, it was still passed in. So what's happened since uh, just about 10 days ago? Uh, of course, on Friday, uh, January 27th, Trump signs the executive order, uh, which suspends all refugees for 120 days and bars Syrian refugee access indefinitely, um, and then uh, prevents general entry of foreigners from the seven listed countries, Iraq, Syria, Iran, Sudan, Libya, uh, Somalia, and Yemen. Um, and then it also barred US green card holders, uh, which was part of the reason that it created such an uproar um, when it did come out. Um, it's important to note that the actual text of the executive order was not released for three hours after it was signed by President Trump, and it further increased um, confusion and chaos, especially for those people who were in transit into the United States. The day after, so obviously um, uh, Friday night, but really Saturday, uh, protests started erupting all over the country and at airports. Um, a Brooklyn judge, federal district court judge, issues an emergency stay against um, the, the executive order. And what that stay did is that it meant that those 
who were already in the United States at the airports could not be deported. But it ended there. It didn't mean that others could come in. Um, the next day, uh, two judges in Massachusetts issued a seven-day restraining order on the executive order, meaning that uh, anyone could come in, right? And that's why at that point on Sunday of last week, uh, community organizations were telling those who were in transit and who had visas, everyone fly in through Logan Airport. Because that was the only airport at the time in the United States that was allowing people from these seven countries on different kinds of visas to be able to come into the United States. Um, because of the intense pressure, that same day, Department of Homeland Security said that green card holders will now be allowed into the country. Um, and uh, also uh, 16 state attorney generals signed a uh, very public uh, letter against the Trump, Trump executive order and said that um, they had doubts over the legality of it. And uh, sorry, that, that they deemed it unconstitutional. The very next day, the acting attorney general, Sally Yates, uh, issued a statement um, regarding the doubts over the legality of it for which she was fired. Um, and then just on Friday, a few days ago, um, a U.S. District Judge from Seattle granted a temporary restraining order against the executive order. So what that means is that for now it is completely on hold and people can come in. And this is nationwide, right? Um, the government had to submit additional legal briefs to the U.S. Uh, Ninth District Court, sorry, Circuit Court of Appeals by Monday, and then hearings began, um, which you can live stream if you've been listening to them, and they're very interesting actually to listen to. Um, so that's sort of a timeline of where we are. Uh, I'm gonna get into this in a second, that US citizens now are being interrogated uh, upon entry in the United States, but we'll talk about that in a second. But this is where the executive order stands for now and the fight back against it. Two important things to note is that protests heavily have helped so if you're involved in them, um, please do continue them. And then two, uh, the, the, the legal um, community has been tremendous in fighting back and suing uh, in, in every single court that they can against this. So how have Middle Eastern American and Muslim American communities responded? One thing to note is that the response to the NSEERS registration in 2001 and 2002, sorry, was slow for a couple of reasons. One is that um, the, it was right after 9-11. So the community was highly on alert, the Middle Eastern and Muslim American community, and also the atmosphere in the United States at that time, for those of you who remember, was not a very welcoming or a very conducive atmosphere to be doing um, a lot of organizing uh, opposite from today's atmosphere, actually. Um, but what it's meant for today is that because of that experience of NSEERS, as ugly as it was, it's, it's meant that the Muslim American and Middle Eastern American communities have now had 15 years of uh, experience and contacts with organizations like the ACLU, um, organizations that uh, can fight back against these things. So as soon as this executive order went into action on Friday, um, January 27th, these organizations kicked in really quickly and already had contacts with these different civil liberties organizations. And that is really key. And that's why the response to this was so much faster than what we saw in NSEERS in 2002. Um, but what started out with, uh, you, you began to see very quickly around Middle Eastern American and Muslim American communities that the response at first was, but none of these seven countries uh, have sent terrorists into the United States. They're banning the wrong countries. And very quickly after that, a lot of sort of other people within these communities and organizations began to push back and say, it doesn't matter. The fact is, as Bashara said at the beginning, this is actually something that it's starting out with these seven countries, but it's, it may and very well could expand. And this is something that's against Muslims in general and Middle Easterners for sure. Um, and so uh, that sort of pushback from organizations to their communities about the need to not single out and be like, but we're the good immigrants and instead be much more willing to build solidarity networks with other immigrant groups and also with social justice um, issues in the United States more broadly. So that's been something that on the community level has been, has been sort of working a lot in just the past days. 
Um, and this need for intersectionality that we saw in the Women's March and that we're beginning to see sort of across the protest to uh, President Trump's policies is something that I think is the silver lining in all of this because uh, this ban will continue in different ways even though it's even if it's struck down the way in which uh, he President Trump is tweeting about um, uh, Muslims and Middle Easterners means that other things are going to happen but also what's happening is that he's targeting multiple communities all across the country. So this need for solidarity and, and stepping up and going out and protesting and working with other communities even when you're not the one being targeted, I think is something that um, is extremely important to continue. Um, so what rights do people have? One thing I want to stress, especially to those of you who will be traveling, if you do hold U.S. citizenship um, and you either have a Muslim-sounding name or in your passport, like in mine, it says that you were born in one of these seven banned countries, even though you have a U.S. passport, or if you look Muslim, um, what's been happening in the past few days is that uh, people have been, U.S. citizens have been stopped at the borders. Um, and uh, worryingly, um, their cell phones and their laptops are being taken and they are being asked for their, um, for their pass passwords and things like that to look into it. So the Fourth Amendment, unfortunately, does not apply uh, when you are at immigration. Okay, that's something to know. You cannot invoke your Fourth Amendment rights as a United States citizen when you are at immigration. Um, this has been the position of the U.S. government for quite some time, and there has been legal precedence on this. Um, so a warrant in, in immigration is not necessary for a, board, uh, a border search, and you can be subject to a search without a warrant. Okay, so as much as you try to fight back, unfortunately, they have the right to be able to do that with you. Um, the Customs and Border Protection has taken the position that it has the right to question any and all travelers arriving to the United States. Um, so you do have to hand over your devices to uh, immigration if you are asked for them. However, you're not required to provide them with passwords. Uh, so you do know that. You don't have to provide them with any sort of password information, but understand that they could crack your phone, you know, crack into, in, like, sort of hack it, um, and your laptops, uh, and they may put tracking devices. There's been a case that just came out of a, a NASA scientist um, who is Muslim American, who was born in this country, uh, who believes that his work phone um, was, uh, there's been a tracking device on it, and this just came out yesterday. Uh, so if your phone has been taken in, do know that those things are available to, for them to do so. Um, so it's highly recommended not to carry any sensitive data with you when you are traveling. Um, and to learn how to do that, I really recommend that you contact either IT services at Brown before you do travel, um, or look up online about how best to do this. Uh, take down your Facebook from your phone. They're check they are checking social media sites on your phone and things like that. So you know, keep that in mind. But it's also recommended that you contact your lawyer, if, if you have one, or the Brown lawyers here, um, if you are traveling to the US and you think you may be targeted coming in, because it's important for them to know. Just really quickly, um, the American Immigration Lawyers Association has some excellent material up online that they update almost on a daily basis. It's a very good material. Look them up. The CUNY Clear Project is also an excellent um, project out of the City University of New York, and they also update their information on a daily basis. The ACLU, obviously, and then CARE, which is um, the Council for American Islamic Relations. Um, those last two organizations have been doing a lot of legal work. So look into all of these organizations for the most updated and you know information that at this moment is not rumor, but is they've sort of worked on it and have put together great PDFs that you can download and have for your own information. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, not sure how the mic works. Can you hear me at the back, so you can hear me? So uh, thank you, Bishara, for inviting me. If there is some or any comfort that non-Americans like myself can offer you, uh, at a time like this, it is to tell you that other parts of the world or the so-called democratic world are also going through similar political experiences. So part of our task as intellectuals or as analysts 
is to understand what we might call the global map of political monsters that is emerging and to examine the resonances and differences within the condition that we share with very varying and different degrees of burden depending on how vulnerable we are or may suddenly become. So my task in these 10 minutes will be to alert you to one such resonance and difference between Trump and the Hindu right-wing and economically far-right Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. It's a useful comparison to make uh, because none less than the Huffington Post have called Trump an apprentice to Modi, invoking the wonderful reality TV show, of course, The Apprentice, which marked uh, Trump's part, part of Trump's entry into political life. And it's very important to think of The Apprentice from a perspective of media theory or cultural theory as a political document because part of Modi and Trump's shared appeal is their projection of themselves and reworking of the idea of political leadership as being a kind of super CEO and to obfuscate our notion of reality, which I'll talk about a little bit, which reality TV is in fact a perfect breeding ground for. So then what kind of apprentice, apprenticeship is this and what can Modi teach us about Trump and vice versa? Since I'm an anthropologist, let me take a step back and begin with an ethnographic moment when of just a few days ago, I was in my current ethnographic field site, a psychiatric clinic in the urban poor neighborhood of Trilokpuri, a so-called resettlement colony, as it's called in government parlance in Delhi, where poor, mostly lower caste Hindus and lower caste Muslims are displaced from slums in more central parts of Delhi and sort of resettled on the outskirts. With occasional and sometimes quite serious outbreaks of Hindu-Muslim violence, this area where I'm doing field work, is called, has been called by popular media the riot laboratory of Delhi. After a year of fieldwork, I had gotten to know, I know now many of the long-term patients of the clinic. On my most recent visit a few days back, two patients, a Hindu and a Muslim patient whom I knew uh, to be friends and sort of fellow heroin addicts, uh, got up to greet me knowing that I was coming back after a while. The Hindu patient sort of greeted me and said, great news from America, no? We Hindus made Trump win. Now our strength has increased. Initially, I wasn't sure what he meant, but I gradually learned more about what he was referring to, a political campaign which received much press in India, Hindus for Trump, uh, run in part from the traditional Hindu rights stronghold of New Jersey, and funded by someone called Shali Kumar, an Indian entrepreneur who, along with his wife, are major donors or were major donors to the Trump campaign. Here they are performing sort of very traditional Hindu ceremony of the lamp lighting at the New Jersey Desi Republic Republican Convention. So to be fair, the Hindus for Trump campaign has also been a source of some embarrassment and controversy for the NRI or non-resident Indian community. The Hindus for Trump Facebook page is itself populated with many other American Hindus leaving exasperated comments on different posts saying things like, please remove this group page, it's an insult to educated Indian people living in the US. <laughs> or pointing out that India has, as it does, the second largest Muslim population in the world, much more than the Middle East. Or other more colloquially worded comments you find, such as, I have reported you hate-filled bozos to Facebook authorities. <laughs> Whoever those may be, I'm not sure. Politically, more broadly than this campaign, support for Trump among NRIs according to pre-election polls, although we may have learned by now to totally distrust these kinds of polls, uh, had put NRI support for Trump at 7%. NRIs were said to be uncomfortable in particular with Trump's demonization of the outsourcing of jobs to India. From his side, interestingly, Trump himself seems to have sensed a resonance. The two-page New York Times spread, which many of you might have seen, which listed 282 people's places and things that Donald Trump has insulted on Twitter, didn't in fact include India or Indians, apart from one very much cited call center accent mocking moment, which was taken to be sort of just light ribbing. In New Jersey, Trump announced to admiring Hindu Americans that he looks forward to working with the great man, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who he says has been very energetic in reforming India's bureaucracy, something Trump, he said, says he wants to do in the United States as well, further celebrating Modi's economic schemes as a model for the US. Trump went, in fact, a step further 
and released a Happy Diwali election ad targeting Hindu Indians with the very, very astute tagline, Ab ki bar Trump Sarkar, he says in Hindi, which has been, which had been Modi's main election slogan, Ab ki bar Modi Sarkar, that is this time, this time around Modi government. So Trump had this Happy Diwali election ad. The resonance that Trump senses with Modi and the Hindu right works along multiple levels. So I'll just quickly point you to some of those. First and foremost is their shared anti-Muslim stance. For those of you who may not have heard of any of these issues before, Modi rose into political prominence as the chief minister of the state of Gujarat in Western India. A defining incident of his chief ministership was what was called the Gujarat, well, some people, it's called the Gujarat riots of 2002, but others have defined it as a pogrom or a genocide in which 3,000 people were killed, the majority of whom were Muslims. Much to the chagrin of the Hindu right, Modi at that time had been denied an American visa because of his alleged role in overseeing or being the chief minister at the time of the riots. A Supreme Court of India monitored special investigation team in 2012 said it found no evidence that Mr. Modi had any role in the statewide killings. This report was challenged some months, a few days after by Zakia Jafri, whose husband, Hassan Jafri, a former Congress politician, was killed by a mob in Ahmedabad city. Ms. Jafri claimed that the investigation had revealed sufficient evidence to implicate Modi and 62 others. One of my own first ever academic essays was on the Gujarat riots after I spent a few weeks working in the riot relief camps in Ahmedabad, initially helping with surveys, sort of documenting household losses and deaths and damages to particular households. But then after a while, I felt I had to write something about the experience. So crucially, I and many others, and here I've flagged for you the best academic account and the best journalistic account, have made the argument that culpability in this case won't be found in any tapes or recorded orders but in governmental silence and complicity and the degree to which, in this case, the violence was systematic. For instance, in the simultaneous arrest of Muslim men that we recorded from many different neighborhoods who had a police record, that is, those with the capacity to organize any kind of protective uh, or retaliatory violence, just a few hours before the violence began. Suddenly, uh, many, many uh, Muslim young men were picked up. So these are the sort of kinds of things one can and should be prepared for in this kind of a climate. Continuing with the sort of Modi-Trump resonance, like I said, there are multiple levels at which this might be seen and understood in different parts of the world. In this part of the world, in particular, there's a particular style, a political style of abrupt action, the so-called executive order, which dispenses with democratic processes altogether. The most recent example, and one can only expect more and more of these in this global climate, the most recent example within India is what is called demonetization, where within a few hours, 86% of currency notes were suddenly withdrawn with just a few hours of notice uh, by an executive order of the Prime Minister, ostensibly with the aim of reducing corruption and so-called black money, but which caused widespread panic, particularly among the poor and in the neighborhoods where I'm doing field work, who depend the most on cash economy since as even colleagues of ours like Ashutosh Varshne have argued in their sort of many people have offered critiques of demonetization, 93% of India subsists in the informal economy. Further sort of Trump Modi resonances can be seen in their shared hatred of social welfare. According to economists like Jean Drez and Ritika Khera who study this stuff, we are currently witness witnessing a severe restriction and pullback in India on any kind of uh, welfare, social welfare schemes. And this was in a country where even pre-Modi, the Indian government spends 1% of its national budget on health, which is lower than even much poorer neighbors like neighbor, neighbor, neighboring countries like Afghanistan or Bangladesh. Um, so a kind of what we are seeing at a very uh, systematic level is a cutting and pulling back of any kind of social welfare mechanisms. One final resonance worth pointing out is an kind of extreme narcissism of style. Modi is known for his deep love of social media, his penchant for selfies, uh, his Modi jacket, which is sort of has his name embroidered on each seam, which I put in interesting contrast to Putin's shirtless style, <laughs> and other stylistic maneuvers which exceed the realm somehow of caricature. From a media studies perspective, I've been asking friends of mine in media studies why Modi, Trump, and others 
are already so far in the realm of caricature that they are almost immune to comedy in some mysterious way, in a way that, for example, George Bush and Sarah Palin were not. Interestingly, within India, both the right and the left have been quite circumspect and hesitant about this Modi-Trump comparison. Modi supporters point out how he comes from a poor background. He's the son of a tea shop owner, as they say. Although we may read this to be, as people have written, as just another face or the promise of aspirational capitalism, of which Trump expresses just a different or more extreme form within the same basic moral framework. Further, somewhat differently, the left in India point out that in many ways, different from Trump, or at least we hope so, who knows what's to come, Modi is backed by popular neighborhood level right-wing cadres who know how to act at his behest, even in the absence of any explicit command, and thereby proof of any culpability on his part. So the right wing is sort of much more uh, systematically organized into neighborhood groups and things like that. So in this sense, I'll end with one philosophical speculation, since my own training lies at the intersection of anthropology and philosophy, on what the notion of truth or speech might mean in this so-called post-truth era. And secondly, I'll end with a note of optimism, unlikely as that might seem. In terms of truth, in ways that I've tried to gesture to, Modi acts or speaks most often through silence. So some might take this to be a strategy of political etiquette. He knows that in this day and age, it's not quite right or it's impolitic to sort of openly air one's prejudices. So you won't find Modi openly uh, telling you what he believes. Trump, in some ways, breaks this basic political compact that one assumes of civility. But in his silence and the sort of hollow espousals of diversity and democratic values, which you often find through Indian government uh, expositions nowadays, you might say or one might say that Modi is in fact more dangerous, or is he? We don't know. And some might say that in his bluster and idiocy, Trump is actually more truthful, or is he? And what then is the value of truth and how do we understand what political speech is today? anywhere in the world. I think this is a question for us to consider in this post-truth era if we contrast Modi's silence with Trump's bluster. Lastly, a note of optimism, or two notes of optimism. The first was offered to me by a graduate student in our department, Sa uh, Sami Suleiman, who's sitting right there, drawing on his experience in political activism and student groups. As Sami said, and others have also sensed this to some extent, it may be the case that a whole new generation of people are becoming politicized, or becoming politicized in a new way, and are becoming more aware of issues that were in fact there all along for more vulnerable minorities. So in that sense, there is something of a silver lining, like Nargis was saying. And on a different note of optimism, from a non-American perspective, which I dare say sounds a little rude, but maybe in the Trump era, we now have the liberty to be more rude. In a similar but smaller meeting a few days ago, a colleague of mine sent a solidarity message for us to read out, saying that she wanted to return to American values that she had once been proud of. I found myself unable to read out this message, so I gave the computer to a colleague of mine who read it out, out of a feeling of revulsion for any invocation of national values. I feel my disciplinary training, my discipline prohibits it. I would resign or not speak rather than saying Indian values. Uh, but also it made me wonder what exactly, it was a puzzlement about what we, we wanted to return to, the Gulf Wars or Vietnam or what exactly. And even with close friends in conversations about Trump, I've been struck by the degree to which many people hold an illusion which is not shared necessarily by non-Americans, I should tell you, that Americans are fundamentally, all said and done, nice and decent people. <clears throat> As someone who's never thought in terms of race, I find myself wondering, and it's a curiosity, if this is an illusion that's shared by everyone, or of if it is only held by white Americans, or actually if there's something I myself need to learn, but as a non-American, I will be grateful for Trump, and grateful to Trump if he helps to deplete this illusion that when all is said and done, Americans are manifestly and uniquely 
decent, honest, hardworking, and good-hearted people. Or maybe they are, and I can learn about that. But as Nietzsche, the philosopher I admire the most, had taught us, it is a terrible and dangerous illusion to believe that one is inherently and manifestly good. So then maybe, who knows, thanks to Trump, America will awaken from its self-imposed immaturity and its repeated naive shock, which is not just I trust and I believe not a performance of grief, but is genuine surprise and dismay each time at its own and our own capacity to produce evil. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, especially to Bashara Dumani and the Middle East uh, Studies uh, staff for organizing this teaching. I knew a woman who taught in a high school in North Carolina. She was teaching on 9 11. Classes were canceled, and teachers were instructed to turn on the TV and have discussions with the students. She asked the students, who do you think did it? All but one responded, Mexicans. The fact is that Mexicans in the previous five years had been moving to this very rural area of North Carolina, and a lot of conflicts had ensued. There are a lot of numbers here, and I wonder which one you might notice and what significance it might have. This is the one that catches my eye. These are actually a little lower than, than the final numbers, but it's the best I could find on the web last night. It seems to me 63 million people is a significant number. Um, and with all due respect, I don't see, um, uh, Bashara, I don't see uh, Trump as a fringe. I actually think that there's a significant portion of the United States that backs him, and we need to learn about that, and we need to understand that, and we need to respond in a way that takes that into account. So I want to make some general points, and then I'm going to turn more to focusing on issues related to Mexico. I don't subscribe to the one big happy family in America model. It seems to me that from the beginning, of this country and before the beginning, differences in conflict have been there and people have acted on these through struggle. I do think this is a learning moment. I do think there's a lot to learn, but I think even more this is a teaching moment. There are people who voted for Trump who earlier had voted for Obama, for instance, and we need to learn about why. But most Trump voters did not vote for Obama. And for many of them, the white lash that has ensued has everything to do with regaining white control and ultranationalist control in their eyes. There are literally millions of white racists and white supremacists and ultranationalists who now feel unleashed. And I think we would be, again, naive not to understand that that is part of what is happening today and that we need to learn and deal with that truth. We can take some solace, however. For those of you old enough to remember and those of you perhaps from California, you've learned about Prop 187. What this did, as it says here, was it denied state services to the over one million undocumented workers, primarily from Mexico and Central America at that time, who were living in California. If you look at the green parts of the map of California, it's evident that there was overwhelming support for this uh, bill. In fact, it came out at 50, uh, well, 59% to 41%. This is the state that today overwhelmingly voted for Clinton and overwhelmingly uh, from the top to the bottom has announced its opposition to Trump. Now, granted, this was a little more than 20 years ago, but one of the things that happened in California at the time was precisely those changing counties where there was a lot of conflict that, are, that occurred and there was a white lash occurring in California 
at that time. But times have changed, populations have changed, and in fact that's what's happening on a national level. I want to talk very briefly about the wall, about DACA, and about the so-called brown peril. I'm not sure you've heard the news today, but in fact Mexico has accepted to build the wall, albeit with somewhat different borders. <laughs> and they have not only accepted the wall, but they're very willing to pay for such a wall. <laughs> the wall is symbolic. There are already, out of the 1,900 plus miles along the U.S.-Mexican border, there are already 650 of those miles that are in fact covered by fences and walls. This is symbolic fear-mongering. The fact is that the border policy for several years now has been to funnel people trying to cross the border into the Arizona desert and let nature take care of things by killing the people as they try to cross. With respect to DACA, I'm sure people here have heard of it. It's called the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. There are over, there's not quite 800,000 young people in the United States who have been allowed to stay and study even though they don't have the full paper documentation. It, uh, nonetheless, the government now has their names and it has where they live, or at least lived, in case they have moved elsewhere and not reported it. Immigration attorneys are particularly worried about DACA being rescinded uh, since it was approved through an Obama executive order. And in fact, widespread civil disobedience has been announced in opposition to any kinds of things like this that would take place. As somebody mentioned, there were, cal there were uh, exclusion laws that were on the books for much of the U.S.'s history, uh, in particular aimed at different groups from around the world. This was a, uh, an image from the late 1800s, but California Exclusion Act only re was reversed in the uh, 1920s. In other words, this is not the first time, this is not the first group of people who have been excluded. And it's also not a situation, it seems to me today, that we can say simply, it couldn't happen again. It couldn't happen anymore. Illegal immigration indeed did start in 1492. We're not just talking about a feel-good history of immigrants who built this country. The fact is that the slaughter of native peoples, the forced migration of Africans, and the riches accumulated on the backs of migrants uh, is what has made this country in large measure what it is today. There's a famous mockumentary uh, that shows uh, through, uh, through the video that this country would screech to a halt, in fact, if there were no Mexicans without papers working for a day. I think that education is certainly important, but facts as we've seen, in and of themselves are insufficient. Struggle is needed because these facts are vital but insufficient. Debate is needed, but it itself is insufficient. One of the things that developed several years ago that I participated in was called the Sanctuary Movement, and this consisted of a network of 500 churches, synagogues, and community centers all over the United States uh, that actually uh, snuck people across the border, often the Texas border where I was, because it's, if you look, it's the closest point to Central America where people were escaping various kinds of repression and civil wars. People were snuck across the border and then ferried around to these 500 centers of various kinds. Um, there's certainly been talk of similar kinds of things, not only sanctuary cities, but more practical sanctuaries that are established in various places. That said, and this gets back to the first point I was trying to make, uh, this means putting your life on the line, not only uh, in terms of the refugees and the immigrants who may need sanctuary, but also those who are helping them. And so I don't want to minimize the risks that people have taken to support others. This, in fact, was a modern underground railroad. And as I'm sure anyone who knows any US history knows, 
This was a very important and a very vital thing, but it was also a very dangerous one. And so I think that one of the purposes of this teaching is precisely to address what can be done and understand the risks involved, but also understand the stakes. Thank you. So thanks for the organizers and for all of you to be here. Um, I'm going to speak from an international standpoint, and I'm going to try to think about uh, international law and specifically about human rights law in front of the executive orders and in front of a hypothetical authoritarian turn. And I'm going to argue that um, I'm going to argue for a qualified pessimism or a Gramscian pessimism, and I'm going specifically to talk about human rights and international law as a double-edged sword that, on the one hand, uh, might uh, justify the executive orders and, on the other hand, might uh, offer uh, tools to, uh, to resist. So we are here discussing the Muslim ban, namely the executive order protecting the nation from uh, foreign terrorists entering to the U.S. However, I would suggest to read this executive order together with the two other executive orders that were issued the same day and uh, two days before, namely the executive order enhancing public safety in the interior of the U.S., which is the executive order that threatens uh, sanctuary jurisdictions with the loss of federal funding, and second, the uh, border security and immigration enforcement improvement executive order, namely the uh, Mexican wall um, order. If you consider these three uh, executive orders together, you can see that um, basically in line with the previous um, 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 teaching, uh, that there is a project, an actual blue policy blueprint in order to enforce uh, if not um, an anti-immigration policy, uh, all white policy in the U.S., which the orders not only en enlist the Department of Homeland Security, the State Department, and the officer, Office uh, of the Director of National Intelligence to devise policies to limit and secure the borders, but also enrolled uh, uh, the state and local police, as well as immigration and border patrol, patrol forces to enforce these policies with increase of 15,000 uh, uh, new recruits. So from an international point, the standpoint, this is a familiar story. So it looks like a state is turning authoritarian, and in relation to these cases, we should expect, and we are already seeing, uh, how the constitutional structure may react in order to impose balances and checks and actually limit uh, executive orders, and on the other hand, we should expect when we are already seeing mobilizations of civil society in order to resist. And that might well, very well happen in, in the U.S., and, and the institutions and civil society will be tested, and we will see what the outcomes are. However, from the international point of view, there are very good reasons to be more pessimistic than optimistic. and. Uh, there are two main reasons that I want to discuss. One is human rights. So human rights has been an extremely successful governance project that has um, developed actual institutional structures in order to protect humans, humans from uh, uh, abuse and moreover has imposed anti-impunity projects of accountability from transitional justice to international criminal law. The reasons for being pessimistic here are two, as I mentioned before. One is the problem of enforcement, and second is the problem of applicability. First, the problem of enforcement. Human rights law developed, uh, international human rights law developed successfully in order to deal with non-Western, peripheral, or uh, failed states, and has never developed well in relation to states like the US. And here the problem is twofold. On the one hand, the city that understands itself to be on the top of the hill, namely the US in exceptionalist terms, always thinks that human rights has, have been for these lower cities and the valleys. And that's why we have never seen in the US actually the use of the international human rights structure. And that's why 
we see torture, or we saw torture, black sites, and Guantanamo uh, being replayed maybe to, in the future, but what we see today is that they were untouched by human rights, by transnational justice, or by international criminal law, which is the difference that explains uh, Milosevic and Pinochet and Bush uh, on the one hand and Bush on the other. The second structural problem of enforcement is not only ideological, it's structural in the sense that um, powers, great powers like the US that have um, veto powers are permanent members in the Security Council are protected against R2P, the responsibility to protect, namely humanitarian intervention that serves for uh, dictators like Milosevic or, or other dictators as, um, as um, limits to what they can do. Um, so the fate of Gaddafi and has Saddam Hussein serves as a limiting in terms of what the sovereign can do, which is not present for uh, members of the Security Council. Not only at the level of uh, uh, humanitarian interventions, but also at the level, as I mentioned before, in relation to universal jurisdiction for crimes against humanity and the ICC. So basically, if you're a member of uh, the Security Council, the mode in which human rights um, enforcement works is limited by the structural issues. So that is one very big problem. However, uh, human rights as a transnational movement has developed ways of, of uh, securing pressure that is transnational rather than international, and there could be some hope there. And there comes the second problem, which is the problem of applicability. The problem of applicability is that actually human rights do not protect humans. They protect subjects who are in jurisdictional context contact with uh, sovereigns. And those who are not in jurisdictional contact with sovereigns are treated as non-humans. Um, the most clear example is migrants or refugees who die in the high seas without any human rights violation. And here let me explain specifically uh, what I mean by the double-edged sword. So on the one hand, there is a convention international convention that protects the rights of refugees. On the other hand, this very convention uh, does not protect the rights of humans and protects only the rights of refugees. So the examples, I'm going to give three examples. First, the very same definition of a refugee under the convention. A refugee, uh, according to Article 1 of the Convention, is someone for, that for well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons and only for five reasons of uh, persecution. Those are race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, and political opinion. Um, those who are n left without the status are those who are actually uh, vulnerable for reasons that do not fit these five categories, and those um, are either economic reasons like extreme poverty, famine, or public health reasons like escaping from an outbreak from, let's say, Ebola, uh, Ebola malaria, or Zika, or because of our natural disasters uh, like a tsunami or an earthquake. So the relevance here is um, uh, in terms of the executive orders is that many people who are going to be precluded from entry in terms of the wall or in terms of uh, the um, limit of, of the entrance of refugees are not even refugees because their status does not fit the five uh, categories. Second, second example is even if you are a refugee, the obligation that sovereigns have in relation to the convention, the refugee convention, is not a universal right to asylum, but is a right to seek asylum. asylum. And therefore, it, there is no right to, uh, for the asylum to be granted. And instead of that, there is an obligation, which is called non refuelment that is not to be returned to a place of uh, danger or persecution. In this case, um, 
uh, the relevance of, of the convention in relation to the executive order is not insignificant. So the executive order actually violates uh, many aspects of the convention. For example, uh, the building of detention camps, according to one of the executive orders, um, would probably until um, so detention camps on the border would probably mean that the U.S. will not determine the status of those who are uh, in, uh, detained. Uh, moreover, the obligations of determining the status of someone as a refugee and therefore triggering the obligation not to return should be one uh, that should not be tainted according to the convention by discrimination. And here, the executive order uh, clearly violates that when it discriminates in terms of nationality in the case of Syrian refugees or it favors religion when uh, the executive order establishes a priority in favor of religious mi uh, minorities. However, as I was saying before, the determination of the status depends on jurisdictional contact. And here is where the wall is basically the right policy to avoid contact. So basically the idea is that those who are escaping from persecution and could be determined as refugees are going to face a wall and the contact will never happen. And this is actually a policy that has a long history or relatively long history in the US. It started uh, during um, uh, the years of the Haitian uh, crisis where Haitian migrants rather than being um, directed to the coast were redirected to the US coast in order to establish the jurisdictional uh, contact were redirected to Guantanamo where um, very big um, detention camps that were then filled with other people as you know. Um, and this is also true for, for Europe. So many Syrian uh, refugees are arriving now uh, back to Tunisia because of agreements between Europe um, and Tunisia in order to redirect um, migrants or refugees or people who are escaping from persecution before arriving uh, into, into Europe. Finally, the third example is that on the one hand, uh, there is, so if you're a refugee, you don't have a right to asylum, but you have a right to seek asylum, and there's the obligation not, uh, uh, of non-refuelment. The actual enjoyment of this privilege or this right depends on arbitrary reasons of geography or politics. So this is the reason why, uh, and the reason is that there is no right to passage from places of persecution, Syria, and jurisdictions of protection, let's say Sweden or, or Norway. So what happens is that uh, according to geography, the states that are more proximate to the places of uh, exit are the ones who receive uh, more refugees. And there is no obligation, because states did not want it, there is no obligation of redistribution of refugees. And this is, I don't know, this is not an executive order, but you know the famous phone call between Trump and the Australian uh, Prime Minister. The reason behind of the agreement uh, that Obama signed with the Australian government to accept Syrian refugees is part of the negotiations to relocate uh, and redistribute the burden of non refuelment Now this one is uh, not a right. This is one that depends, again, on the arbitrary uh, circumstances of politics. So in this case, there would be no uh, infringement on the obligations of the U.S to basically refuse uh, those uh, refugees. So let me, uh, I'm the last one, so I'll be very, very brief. So let me just finish with, with uh, the main argument that I wanted to uh, put forward of the double-edged sword. So on the one hand, um, human rights is an international law is um, a discourse that actually legitimized many aspects of the executive orders that uh, we, for normative reasons, would, be, would uh, resist. And therefore, international law should not be understood to be the thing that would save uh, the US from itself, as it is promoted in other parts of the world. 
But on the other hand, uh, international law, what, what the, the, the lesson from other places, um, from Latin America to uh, Eastern European countries, the, the story of the use of human rights or apartheid, let's think about South Africa, the, the cases where international law has been used for counter hegemonic purposes or in a struggle has never been for human rights. It has been always for a struggle where people have used human rights and international law as a tool. So I wanted to finish with the idea that if we want to resist, we should resist for normative reasons and then selectively think about which aspects of international law are helpful and which aspects are not. Thank you. I hope you feel the same way that I do, which is that this is a great panel, a really great panel. And I, I couldn't be happier to have colleagues here, Brown, who can pull this off at very short notice um, and not only speak to us uh, analytically and in a very informed way, but also from the heart. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good moment. I uh, wanted to also say something very quickly before we start the uh, question and answer period. And I, I invite people right now to start lining up behind the microphone if they have questions. Is that the universities cannot stand alone. Uh, we cannot do it all by ourselves, and we should not even think that way. And I'm not just talking about uh, personal um, responsibilities that we have to make solidarity and learn from each other, but also that we have a community right here in Rhode Island that uh, has refugees, that has organizations that work with refugees. In fact, several Middle East Studies concentrators work in uh, these organizations. Uh, it's very important to have the voices of this uh, community be part of our discussion. If any of you are from there, please, uh, I encourage you to come and speak. We will have many events in the future, uh, whether we like it or not, <laughs> that deal with these issues and we'll make sure that these connections to the local community, uh, I would mention specifically Dorcas and AHOPE are organizations you need to look into if you haven't heard from them, about them before and, and, and see if you can get involved. All right, uh, we welcome questions to the panel. And we'll just alternate between the two. Hi, I had a fairly um, straightforward question, which is I uh, was wondering what the expected timeline is um, in terms of the appeals process on the uh, executive order. When can we expect to hear? about that and if it's as it's expected to be um, going to the Supreme Court, how quickly would that process happen? Um, so the, it's expected by lawyers and people who are tracking this that the uh, appellate court will actually rule fairly quickly. Uh, then the process that happens is that most likely the Trump administration will appeal. So let's say the appellate court goes in favor of um, keeping the restraining order, of saying that the uh, executive order is not constitutional. Then the Trump administration can appeal, which they most likely will, and then it'll go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court as of now is, is split for, is, we only have eight judges, right? So the possibility that it could split 4-4 is there. What that means is if it does split 4-4, then whatever the appellate court ruled will then be, become law. That's it. So if the appellate court rules in that the executive order is unconstitutional, then that's what becomes law. If the appellate court rules in favor of Trump's executive order, then the other parties will appeal and go to the Supreme Court. In the case that there, again, it splits 4-4, then whatever happens in the appellate court will stay. Um, the process of going from the appellate court to the Supreme Court kind of depends on how long it takes whichever side to get their arguments ready. The side that's working for the Supreme for, for the civil liberties it wants to move things along obviously very quickly. Um, and the Trump administration's DOJ even two nights ago wanted to ask for more time, but it was denied that time. So it, it depends on how it, it works out, but the appellate court should rule fairly quickly. Uh, 
Um, this is this is going to be a broad question, I guess, but what can we do? And by we, I, I both mean students, but also <laughs> separately Americans and, well, people like me who are non-residents. So uh, we can take a look at a room and ask people here what have they done. And I see many faces that I've recognized uh, <clears throat> from uh, the immediate kind of reaction, which was to go on demonstrations, to sign petitions, to uh, try to meet together within departments or units or families or groups to build your own community, get your support, uh, get your feelings out, but also start thinking about long-term strategy. And here. I begin with an apology for my generation in a way we delivered a world that's maybe not necessarily any better than the one we got to you politically. Um, uh, but we have learned a few lessons um, in our own activist days and I think across the generations uh, we've learned different kinds of lessons and these things I think we should find a way to share. Uh, so I would say seek out people who've been active in the past and see what worked or what hasn't worked. And it's amazing what's happening in social media today. Uh, the enormous opportunities. I mean, Nargis and others went to the airports right away, for example. Um, and that was not just a hasty, stupid act that turned out. It turned out to be really very important. And in fact, a pivotal turn in how people were galvanized around this. So. Um, I'll stop there. If I could add to that, I think uh, what we can do, what all of us can do is um, talk to people who support this. Because it's one thing to talk to, I suppose many of, most of us in this room, perhaps uh, we all agree with each other. But I th I've always thought it's really, really important to talk to the people who don't agree, who, who are supporting this ban. And often I think what you'll find is they don't know the facts. So when Trump says that the country is being overrun with refugees, go to them with the facts that it is not, that it takes seven years for somebody to come from Syria or Iraq to this country. It takes two years for somebody to come from Somalia. And uh, the number of refugees that America has taken from Syria is, is shamefully low. It's, um, Obama brought in 10,000 in 2016. Uh, but between 2012 and 2015, 2,000 refugees from Syria in all those years were taken in. And 10,000 is a shamefully small number when compared to the number of refugees coming out of Syria. So no credit to the Obama administration at all. But I think facts really matter. And when people are supporting this order, perhaps it's important to understand firstly, let them speak. You know, let them explain to you, don't shout them down or don't, you know, I know the immediate reaction is, uh, you know, this is crazy. But perhaps let's listen to why they're supporting it and then counter it. If they say, look, the country is being overrun by refugees, tell them, no, actually, this is the number. If they say, well, we have poor people here and they need our help. This is some of the things that people are saying, right? There are poor, poor people dying here. Yes, the poor children of Syria, but what about the poor people here? Listen to that. You know, that perhaps that, that's a genuine concern. And then you can say, I don't think it's an either or. You know, so I think letting people talk, talking to people across the divide, I think it's really important to do. It's the hardest thing to do. I don't do a good job of doing it. But I, I think we all perhaps can and should. So if you know people in your wider networks who are Trump supporters or supporters of this, of this executive ban, don't exclude them from your world. Talk to them. If you can convince even one person to change his or her mind, that's worth it. That's what I would say. One thing I would just add as far as strategy, um, he's, the Trump administration is most likely going to come after DACA, as Matt was saying. And, um, that would then affect students you know, on our campuses. So one thing I would suggest is to create like a text tree or, you know, but, do, but be smart. So do it in Signal, download Signal if you don't have it because, and I'm serious about this, but I, I've, I've worked in authoritarian regimes. Like it's, 
serious the way that you can be tracked on, on your text messaging and on social media. So use Signal or use WhatsApp, which is also encrypted now. But um, Signal is much better. The Signal is a lot better, yeah. Um, and, and especially when you're dealing with things like DACA students, uh, cr you know, figure out, you, or I'm sure there are organizations on campus, and figure out who would be at risk. Create text trees so that if, if something happens, people can alert one another really quickly. I mean, this is what was happening with uh, the protests that went into air the airports. It was people who knew one another, who alerted each other very quickly, and then were posting on social media, and people were showing up, and people were asking to be there to translate for refugees, and for less so refugees, but really for visa holders who were coming in. So you have to know people and trust people. So create those sort of circles with one another and make sure that you have each other's backs when something happens and you have a very immediate way of knowing when something is about to happen to your fellow students um, or colleagues. Could I just also make a, on a, in terms of strategy, um, Shortly after the, the ban was announced, there, were some, there was some polling on this question of like who supports it. And it turned out at, at that moment, shortly after the ban, a majority of Americans supported it. Okay? And many of those Americans are in your families. Okay? And they're not horrible people, I presume. But they are uninformed. I think most Americans are uninformed in a certain, on a very key, on a, on a key issue here, which has to do with the concept of a visa. Okay. Most Americans who travel abroad have never had to apply for a visa to go anywhere in the world. Okay? You say, I shall go to France. I shall go, and you go. Right? I shall go to Egypt. That's where I shall go, and you just go. And if you need a visa, it's issued at the airport. Right? There's, there's no applying for visas. Most people in the world don't live like that. To travel anywhere, if you're not part of a privileged small group of countries, you have to surrender your passport. First of all, before you surrender your passport, you have to wait in line outside a Western embassy, okay, for hours sometimes before you're allowed to enter the embassy. At which point, if you're lucky to be granted an interview several weeks in advance, okay, at that point you surrender your passport for possibly several weeks while you are vetted. At which point you may be granted a visa. Now these are not people going on holiday. These are people who have to, uh, travel for business, who have to factor all this in when they travel for business. I have a trip coming up to Latvia in eight months. I better apply for a visa now, right? Most Americans have never had to do, deal with this. And so most Americans who approve of the ban imagine that, that all these people coming from Iran and Iraq and Syria are arriving at American airports the way they arrive at foreign airports and say, I shall go here, let me in. America doesn't let people in. Right? America, ha you have to apply for a visa to get into the United States. And that is that we have a whole apparatus for that. Okay? So on strategy, inform the people that you, who are part of your family, who, are, who say, you know, well, you know, it probably makes sense. I think I kind of agree with President Trump when he says that we shouldn't just let anybody into the country. We don't let anybody into the country. There are humiliating procedures to prevent people from coming into the country. And I think if people just knew that, then they would pause and think, well, why should we just ban people on the basis of their religion or where they come from, from even being allowed to have the privilege of applying for an American visa? So that's something we can do. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, we're to oh, okay. Either way. Just two comments. One, um, Nargis, with your talk, it made me think of something that Immediately after the, the whole debacle with the, um, the, the ban, the ACLU was warning students, or not students, I'm sorry, was warning people with green cards, I think it was specifically about green cards, that apparently there was a form being distributed at some airports that would, you would rescind your right to your green card. And they were saying, whatever you do, don't fill out that form. So that would be something important. I don't think it applies to people on student visas, but certainly with, for people with green cards. I don't know if that's still happening, but just something to be aware of for people coming back into the country. And the other thing that I just wanted to say briefly is about what can be done. And obviously, you know, you've spoken to so many of the things that can be done. And I think one more that's important to remember is that uh, representatives and, and senators do listen. So, and apparently better than emailing is calling. So when people call up those, you know, those phone calls that take like 30 seconds or a minute or whatever, 
those are listened to, they're logged, and those are, are, are very influential. And in fact, right here in Rhode Island, Sheldon Whitehouse had uh, voted to support, I forget now because they're all kind of blurring together, but two of the appointees, originally he had, had uh, accepted to support them. And then after the protest that happened here in Providence and with all of the um, phone calls and so forth, he actually reversed that and ended up uh, not supporting any of them. So I, I think that that's a, just a case in point of how voices can be heard, especially when they are, we're all together and there's a sea of voices, that's, that definitely makes a difference. That's it. Um, so if the law, if the ban passes, do you think that um, there's a possibility that this will extend to other Muslim countries? So like if you're from a Muslim country which is uh, not um, these seven countries, should we be worried? Are we at risk? Yes. yes. <laughs> Definitely yes. And remember that much of this really is not about the threat of terror from these countries, but about setting up a situation in this country for completing this process of racializing Muslims. And I think we have a lot to learn from communities that have undergone this experience in the past uh, about how to deal with this issue. Thank you. And before these protests sort of got bigger, um, there was a, a draft circulating um, that had been leaked uh, that more, I can't remember the number now, it might be 11, but I'm, don't quote me on that, uh, countries that were going to be added to the banned list. Uh, and it included um, more countries in the Middle East as well as in Africa and two countries in Latin America, uh, which were Venezuela and Colombia. Uh, so there, but they had to step that back because of the protests that were happening. So if it's successful, do anticipate more countries to be added. This is black joke going around that, um, or, or like I have Lebanese friends, for example, who are like, let's tell Trump to build a Trump hotel in Lebanon so that we won't be part of the, of the band. So I would, I would highly recommend anybody from a Muslim country, I imagine you're Turkish, please write to your government and say, just quickly build a Trump hotel because you know, that'll, that'll keep you safe. It's a black joke, but. So I, I kind of have a problem with the strategy question. So I, in addition of being an international lawyer, I'm from Chile, I grew up in a dictatorship. So on the one hand, the good news is that most dictatorship end at some point. The bad news is that, uh, and this goes back to the idea that I think human rights and the idea of the rule of law that is so strong in the US might be a problem rather than a solution. And the, the, the idea would be that South Africa, the apartheid ended not because of the rule of law or human rights. It was a struggle. The same thing with Chile, the same thing with other countries. And I have the sense that we are, why are we doing this? Why are we uncomfortable with what is happening is because of discrimination. And I think that the, the, the real danger is that we get the Supreme Court to say, well, let, give me a balance test and I would say three countries yes, two no, and we're great. And, and that is the danger. And I think the danger goes back to the idea that um, violations of rights or, or authoritarian policies happens because of lack of information. Or that would be one for the US. And I think if this would be happening in, in Latin America, it would be because we're savages and we haven't learned enough. And I think that the, the, the problem is that we're not able to identify who is benefiting from this. What is the agenda behind? And this is what was one of my ideas of bringing these three executive orders together. I would have, if I would have had more time, I would add all the others, which is deregulation. It's now liberal deregulation plus an authoritarian turn plus some social conservatism. And then we will see who the enemies who the friends and who the enemies are, and in those terms, to organize a struggle, and not in terms of discrimina uh, formal rights, discrimination, um, 
ban including who is concluded, who is, ex is excluded. And so far, and with this I finish, so far, so I was young, but I, I, I was during the last years of the dictatorship, and it was clear who the enemy was. So we would go, I mean, going to a protest here is a very weird experience for me, because you are victimized, you are a victim. You go there not as someone, when I was young, I would go with the sense that I am in a fight against you, and you are the police or, or the government official or the neighborhoods that support Pinochet. And, and they will know me, they will know, th and those neighborhoods will, uh, actually I finished a few times in the hospital because they would know that I was the enemy for them. And I think that is not happening in the US. That is not happening. Somehow this is an abstract problem of the rule of law and human rights and it's not a struggle. Yeah, I, thanks for that. That actually maybe my uh, continues that thought, but thinking of what it means to fight and what new forms of civil disobedience might be to take a phrase from the Martha Nussbaum poster outside and also a great tradition of uh, American thought and political action. But I think I may have a darker picture of human nature maybe than Srimati. Uh, I don't know, but I just want to go back to the point I was raising about what the value of facts is in this so-called post-truth era uh, or how one overcomes a certain naivety or what it means to share facts. And if there are facts and those are astonishing, for example, in relation to refugees, if one was to just even uh, do a quick internet search on the number of refugees absorbed by Pakistan or even India, uh, then it's comical, the so-called refugee crisis of Europe or the uh, what Western countries complain about refugees, it's laughable. Uh, so how are those facts to be shared? And is it the case that if we meet our antagonists and just share these facts with them, they will suddenly change their mind and say, oh, we were so misguided, uh, we didn't know the facts. Uh, that has been an assumption to some extent of the teaching tradition in the US, uh, but I don't know if that's the case anymore in both in our digital era when people know this stuff to some extent or if they don't then what the value of revealing it is still uncertain to me and I want to think about. But what I like or what Matt's presentation particularly signaled for us is older traditions of sort of radical civil disobedience or forms of action which one has to imagine into existence which one doesn't uh, which to some extent is uh, based on certain kinds of daring and it may be uh, fighting in a non-violent sense, uh, that is in the sense of civil disobedience, but designing forms of radical action uh, which we don't yet know and what would those look like is worth thinking about together in, this, uh, in, a, in a milieu like this uh, and drawing on some of the older repertoires of action as uh, Matt and Bishara were pointing to. But I don't know, basically, the proposition I'm offering you is that there are facts, uh, and those facts are astonishing. But uh, sharing them with people, I don't know if it will change their opinions fundamentally uh, and what it means to share uh, or what it means to fight. Um, I just wanted to echo uh, my colleagues up here, the last two. I, I think one of the things that should be evident is that in terms of what to do, different people have different approaches based on their analysis. And I think that some of us um, feel that changing minds of people is not only necessary but possible, and some of us feel that it would be great but perhaps less possible. And this certainly, I mean, talking about, you know, the history of, of struggle in any country, um, you don't have one homogeneous attitude and approach to anything. If you take the Vietnam War, if you take the Civil Rights Movement, which some people wouldn't have identified with. They would have said, I'm part of the Black Liberation Movement, not the Civil Rights Movement. In the anti-war movement, you had people who wanted nothing to do with Vietnam, per se, and others who actually championed the NLF, uh, the, the, the North Vietnamese. And so you will have differences of opinion, and that's okay and you will have people taking different approaches, and that's okay. The only thing I would sort of emphasize is 
even if we change and we can change some minds, I think we have to be ready for the fact that we're not going to change most minds of, of, uh, out of that 63 million plus who voted. And that's okay. Because at no time, I mean, if you think back to the 1972 election in the United States, does anybody remember how many states Nixon won? 49 out of 50. 49 states voted for Nixon. It felt pretty demoralizing, to say the least, at that time. We didn't win over the majority of people at that point. That didn't mean that the struggle wasn't good, wasn't important, that there were different ways to approach it. But if I, th I think if we'd said, oh shoot, we've been fighting so long and we still can't convince people, let's give up. That would have been wrong. Uh, all right, so uh, Professor Gutman, you, talk, you talked about um, studying and learning about the 63 million American racists. Uh, the 63 million American racists, you spoke about studying and learning and dealing with them. And my question is, what would, what would that learning and dealing with look like? So what form does that take? And then building off of that, um, do for all of you, I guess, do you think there's a risk of normalizing racist language in the US? And especially like in, I guess we've been talking about like a post-fact era, is there a risk of, of shining a limelight on racist or bigoted language or, or actions and having that sort of become a normalized thing without any possibility of checking it with fact? Uh, yeah, that's it. So um, you spoke about learning and dealing with American racists, and I was wondering what that learning and dealing uh, actually looks like and what form that takes and then whether there's a risk of normalization of racist language um, because we Sorry, live in this yeah. post-fact era. I mean, I think, again, I would just repeat what my, my last comment, and that is I think we can uh, transform racists into anti-racists, but I don't think we should get our hopes up that we're going to transform tens of millions of people who are pretty damn happy right now um, and feel very empowered and the fact that the press actually is covering so few of these attacks that have been unleashed in schools and uh, universities, high schools, and, and, and below all over the country, I think is a shame. Um, so I do think more what I was trying to get across is that it's, it's a nice idea because we are right and they're wrong to think that simple education is what it's going to take and it's just because they don't know. I don't think in many cases that's as simple. I think some people like being white and like being in charge and like being number one in the world and I think that you can reduce the numbers but I think you also have to acknowledge in a country like the United States that has been so powerful for so long and white people have been so powerful for so long, the idea of a black president was absolutely an abomination and they're getting their revenge right now. And I think that we have to understand and take seriously the repercussions that can unfold in the next while. I don't know, whether, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and in our, I mean, anthropology is a discipline which has sought to understand forms of otherness, including the otherness of political divides. I have a, a student who uh, is doing his senior thesis on gun culture uh, and uh, NRA conventions and got so into it that he has decided to buy a gun uh, himself. Uh, but what he's revealing is actually a very creative way of understanding what it means or the notion of freedom and how central it is in a particular idea of sovereignty uh, in which basically you don't cede the right to kill to the state. So he's showing how you understand that thought process in which to be sovereign, that is to be free, is maintaining the right to kill. So we may not like that, but maybe we understand it a little bit better. Uh, will that make us convert them? I don't think politics only works in the model of conversion, uh, but it will add to a thought process, hopefully, in which uh, one understands things a little better and hopefully then can intervene uh, in the logic of, say, uh, what that oppositional form of life is. Can we take the next three questions together? and then conclude.
please. So my question is, so I was pretty blindsided by the result of the election, and I realized that my view of the world was not necessarily reality, and there were a lot of people who thought differently than me. And you know, I've tried to you know, make an effort to have more diverse media just so I can understand the world and ad address it. So what efforts, if any, is Brown going to make to invite conservative or Republican intellectuals to events such as these? Um, yes, I, I agree with you. I think this is very important. Um, I'm a foreigner. I do not have an American passport, but I'm going to have a PhD for you know, a couple of years here. So this is why I think it is important for everyone here to have a, st a stable political environment. And I keep watching CNN's New York Times, Fox News, and even Breitbart. <coughs> And I feel like uh, sometimes people are not listening to each other. They are just uniting their own camp. And this is not something I think would be helpful. And to some extent, my perspective is that all issues, including this tra travel ban one, have been politicized. And I would also agree with the gentleman sitting there saying that not all Trump supporters are nasty guys. And they support Trump out of a variety of reasons, not necessarily misogyny, because he has a whole bunch of female supporters, not necessarily because they hate Muslims or Asians. For they could support Trump for a lot of other reasons. And this is why we need to reach out and really listen to their voices and try to understand their concerns and see if we could help them a bit without giving up our red lines so that we could gain their support. Of course, I, I agree with Professor Gutman that you know you are bound to have a whole bunch of very stubborn guys, but. It is also extremely important to win over those who are relatively moderate. And they are also, I mean, on this travel ban issues, my, my idea is that it's also not that easy because, well, I have seen news pieces which, which are startling, but I haven't verified that. And as a young historian, I think it is my professional morality to be skeptical over all these things before verifying them. But some of the news I have heard goes on like, you have cases of implementing um, radical Islamic laws in sanctuary cities. I don't know if that is, this, I don't know if it is fake news. Well, I don't know, because I, I haven't been there, and it could be well alleged, but what if it is true? And we could also think of uh, the problem of proportion, because I would just say most people, you know, whatever you believe in, Christianity, um, Islam, or Confucianism, or whatever things, I think most people are good men. So this is why it is important to think in more details and try to unite you know, good people together and see how we could you know, reach out and stop this situation of polarization. I think unity is as important as holding our red lines. I share some of the skepticism of uh, making, you know, factual claims in response to, uh, let's say, statements that want to craft reality more than describe it, which I think is how to, in some ways, describe the statements of Sean Spicer, of Trump, of Kellyanne Conway. So in thinking further about how to deal with 
our kind of epistemological dilemma right now, especially in light of um, the Trump administration actually um, making up massacres by refugees, claiming that the murder rate is higher than it's been in decades when in fact it's lower than it's been uh, in decades. Um, and also the fact that, that Breitbart can apparently convince, you know, very well-educated um, people. Uh, I, I wonder if in, in, in uh, expressing skepticism towards the kind of uh, making factual claims against people who do not know the details of vetting, the details of immigrant bans, if we're um, sort of stuck between a dilemma that, that is a bit misleading, which is one either facts or, on the other hand, struggle, civil disobedience, um, radical organizing. I, I'm certainly for that model, but also we might be missing out on the forms of affect and narrative that are being used by the right. Um, something that we're, we're not discussing much are images and narratives and the way that we would want to sculpt reality as well. Um, uh, so I think it's just something that, that is a general failure of the left um, uh, in recent times and is something maybe we should reflect on more together um, uh, to think about, you know, what it means when an image really changes how we all act. And in some ways, civil disobedience leads to those images, right? Uh, in the ways that the protests at the airports go viral and give us a certain kind of affective uplift that gets us going through, you know, the depressing push notifications like Sessions was just apparently confirmed five minutes ago. Um, uh, so, so, so how do we keep mobilizing those images, those narrative stories, and is that something that fundamentally does something different than, on the one hand, international law, on the other, facts, um, you know, the, this sort of regime of information that, that is, is in some ways really tied to the kind of, you know, Clintonite politics, the, the ones that really don't mobilize people. We have, uh, we're five minutes over time, but we have two people standing. Yeah, just a brief question. So two brief questions and then maybe even briefer responses from us so we can all let you go. Okay, uh, so my question is, if these isolationist policies come into place, such if these isolationist policies actually come into place, such as the ban uh, is deemed legal and the wall, if you believe that this will result in a wave of isolationism across the world or if you think that like the cultural and political ideological hegemony will kind of shift away from the United States and if so where do you think that will be? Um, hi. Uh, my question is if it's possible that laws like the one that is in Arizona that um, allows officers to detain people who look like internet um, I'm sorry, um, immigrants will spread throughout the Mexican-American border. Shall we uh, go in order uh, this way, Matt? Because the last question, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm half deaf, so I understood something about the wall, Arizona. No, no, there's a, a you know, uh, it, if I may paraphrase, uh, I think law enforcement in Arizona is empowered to uh, detain. detain people who look like immigrants. And do you, the question was, do you think this will spread to the rest of the country? Just, I don't think we know what's gonna happen. Just to bring back, at the time of the sanctuary movement in the 1980s in this country, there were plans, they were published, you can look in the New York Times, for uh, huge detention camps in the Gulf Coast, particularly Louisiana and the, uh, the so-called Golden Triangle of Texas, Port Arthur and whatnot. They were expecting or they were planning for the possibility that hundreds of thousands of people from Central America would stream across the border and they had plans to incarcerate them in major uh, detention centers and they were building them, and they had strategic plans for how to cope with them in terms of National Guard and whatnot. That's just a little bit of history that most people don't know. I don't think we know exactly what the plans are, what exactly is going to develop. I don't think we should walk around freaked out, but I think we should be ready. I think if you uh, think it would be a good idea, make copies of all documents that you think might be relevant, that you think and carry copies with you at all times 
if you think you could ever be picked up and ever be put in a position uh, of deportation or incarceration or something like that, for instance. Uh, obviously, there's other things to do, too. Uh, <clears throat> well, luckily, Nargis's bread and butter occupation is as a media theorist, so I will defer to her on the media aspect of it, although there is something like you're saying. There have been very good analysis, like Brian Masumi, for example, on media mobilization in the Bush era or the sort of generation of panic uh, or Reagan. Um, I think of, again, Masumi's analysis of Reagan. But with Trump and this phase, there's something else in the sort of media and affective mobilization which uh, is quite opaque uh, in terms of what forms of mobilization are happening. Um, what those are, Nargis will tell us. Um, but I think one basic thing I'd like to sort of emphasize in relation to what we've been speaking about or what is to be done, as Lenin famously asked uh, in a great text, uh, I think there are different moments of politics. Uh, one is the sort of immediate concrete solidarity. Uh, we just had a meeting in our own department of anthropology where these students' research is immediately affected. People are scared of when they leave the country, what will happen. Uh, somebody in our department was re-entering. Police had to verify that she actually belongs to the anthropology department. Who would they call? So we need to find someone who can be on a 24-hour emergency number uh, to say, who do you call if you're stopped? Uh, and you have to prove that you belong to such and such department or such. So concrete solidarity is one aspect of it. Listening is another aspect of it. But equally important aspect is fighting. Uh, politics, uh, Foucault famously said, is war by other means. Uh, what those other means are, I think, is to be thought about. Uh, that is, one shouldn't forget that politics is about antagonism and that um, how to fight is also a very important aspect of political thought. Uh, and there's a kind of enfeeblement of radical thought in our uh, idea that this solidarity or listening are the only moments of politics, uh, and a need to rethink what it means to fight uh, and to wage war. Um, just quickly to the last two questions on that side. Uh, so actually, th that, that uh, what is happening in Arizona is part of the blueprint of one of the um, three executive orders in the sense of authorizing local and state law enforcement to be immigration officers. And, and basically that would be illegal, but again, what I want to convey that in a situation like this, we shouldn't fetishize what is legal and what is illegal. We should be more, um, and this is the optimistic side. This is, I think, where going back to the Leninist moment, we're in a moment of figuring out what is, what we want to be, um, re what we want to regard as just and unjust, acceptable and not. And now to the question of the role of the US, I think I don't see this as an isolationist policy. I see it as a imperialist policy that um, entails revising the basis, basic in in international structures from NATO to the UN to revising the uh, uh, um, economic treaties. So there is probably, rather than isolationism, there are going to be trade wars and another type of international conflicts. Um, I want to address the student, I think it was you who said, you know, what is Brown doing to invite uh, people? You know, I don't know, uh, you know, I don't talk to whoever Brown is, but I think, uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm still getting used to the fact that I actually work here. <laughs> but I think we should, and I, I just want to reserve the right when somebody from the administration comes, and they should come, that we can challenge them. That it's not, it's going to be gloves off. So I think in some ways I want to address what is coming out from my colleagues here. When I say listen to people, I don't mean listen to them and don't engage with them. I mean listen to them and then take your gloves off and say everything you have to say. So by all means, please invite you know whoever is here from the administration. Invite them, but let us talk to them. So if anyone dares to, to say in any forum that the reason for this ban is to protect Americans, to protect from people pouring in, I'm going, I reserve the right to say, well, here are the 15 steps that any refugee, 15 steps that any refugee or anyone from any country way before Trump um, had to pass to get here. 
And I think that's, again, I go back to this point that information matters. Because people on the other side of the divide who are anti-Trump do not know that some of these policies go back to Obama's era. 15 steps that uh, you know the, the Iraqi student I talked about had to go through before he could come here. That has nothing to do with Trump or George Bush. That is Obama. I think we should talk to these people. I think, yes, invite them. Let's not take them to the best restaurants. Or let's take them to a Mexican or an Iranian restaurant <laughs> if they come. But let us fight them. Let, them. let them be heard, but as long as they hear us. And of course, for them, you know, we are the enemy. Brown is one of the most hated because apparently we're so liberal. But if they, if they were to come, I think we should invite them. But please, let's take them to an Iranian restaurant for, for dinner. Uh, I'll just respond by saying that to the gentleman who brought up the, the point about engaging with the other side and keeping your red lines, I think um, the nature of authoritarianism is that the red lines don't exist. So they, they want it all. Um, and so I think uh, one of the, the slogans that I detest the most in these protests is love Trump's hate because I actually think it's, it's, um, it's not, I understand if you mean in the radical sense of love, but I really think it's struggle Trump's hate. It's struggle that Trump's this sort of authoritarianism that's coming out of this administration and that means fighting and that means really putting ourselves in a situation that in our generations we may not have had to face as much before and, and, and understanding that it's going to take a lot more than retweeting and liking and posting things, although those matter as well, but those are just one aspect of a larger thing and I, uh, having studied and lived in authoritarian places, do not believe in uh, engaging the other side in the hope that um, they will understand and then accept uh, our side. It's actually that they, they trample upon. So you need, to, you need to hold tight and struggle for, for that bit. If uh, we learned anything from the Oslo process is that uh, countless <laughs> meetings of uh, sharing, humanizing, talking, dialoguing, et cetera, can only take you so far. And the only thing that's really made a difference in the shaping this long-lasting conflict for a long time is what people are willing to stand up for and uh, what they're willing to do to protect themselves and protect uh, what they think is a just thing to do. So, but I do understand the question that we are here in a university and we are paid to talk in shades of gray. If the world is black and white, you don't need universities, and we're supposed to apply a kind of a rigorous, theoretical, methodological set of practices that makes our truth, our facts, somewhat weightier than anybody just mouthing off in the street. This is what we get paid for. And this kind of professionalism uh, puts us in a very difficult position at this moment, because on the one hand, you want to defend uh, your profession. What is it that you do? What, what, what is it that I do that makes a difference and that counts for something? And on the other hand, we know from study after study after study that this is not how political change actually really happens. Um, the, one wonderful study that came out a long time ago, I remember, said the more local news you watch, the less you know. Because local news is always framed in a particular way. You start with the fires and the murders and the car accidents and so on. And it just repeats day after day after day. And the information about specific people, incidents, etc., goes in one ear and out the other. And all that people remember really is the frame. That's all they remember. And so for them, the watching the news doesn't become an information gathering place. It becomes a kind of a channeling place where you channel a particular habit of thought. Right? This is what's happening, and people understand that in the powers that be, and they invest hundreds of millions of dollars every year in creating these channels of thought. And they do it deliberately, they do it with strategically, they do it without any sense of principle whatsoever, because it works and it gets them what they want. And to simply say that a bunch of university professors are going to go out there and give out the facts to people or talk to people 
in the light of a power structure that actually involves in, in enormous investments in channeling thought is laughable. What universities, professors, and others can do is actually be part of their own local communities and work with them on a grassroots level to try to bring in everybody in that community. Fine, you talk to everybody in that community, but you work within your community, you try to change it from the bottom up. That's been my experience. Uh, and I think that's the only thing that really works. And we have to think outside the walls of this university uh, in, in everything that we do. If we're going to get anywhere, that's my personal feeling. Yeah. One really quick thing, and that is, although I've been pleasantly surprised by the press coverage of some of the major mainstream press, if you can read what people are saying in other countries who don't speak English, read the foreign press, listen to foreign uh, uh, coverage of all these things, if you only read English, at least go to foreign press. It seems to me that a broader perspective on virtually everything, one of the things good and bad about the United States is somebody sneezes here and it has to be covered all over the world. And it's precisely because of the imperial position of the United States. But the fact is that everything that we've been talking about tonight is being covered extensively in virtually every major source of uh, uh, press around the world and they have different perspectives well worth learning from. <clears throat> so, to your question, Fox News is bad, and, and in continuation of Matt's thought, if you're an intellectual, I would say, and you're doing a PhD, then you're an intellectual, every great intellectual, Marx, Rousseau, Nietzsche, Thoreau, have all warned against spending too much time with news. Uh, there is a colonization of our minds by news, uh, I would say limit it to no more than 20 minutes a day. <laughs> 20 minutes. Uh, my own rule is 15 minutes. Uh, that may be very uh, unfashionable in this digital era, but better to read a book of philosophy, that is, uh, say, Adorno's Rise of the Authoritarian Personality, <laughs> will certainly tell you more than spending two hours uh, on the news. So my general thought would be avoid the news. Um, <laughs> Uh, except for 15 minutes just to know what sort of today's global disaster is. All right. Thank you very much.